Hey, hey, everyone. This is Carlos. I am the founder and CEO at Product School. And today I'm here with Andrew Luo, who's the co-founder and CEO at One Schema. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Carlos. It is a pleasure. I'm excited to have you on the show because man, your company is very incredible to me. Like The fact that you're literally building a category around CSV imports is fascinating. So maybe we can start with the, the founding story and that, that pain that you probably experienced importing some of those CSVs before. Yeah, definitely. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, every time we talk to an engineer or a product manager, they look at our product and they're like, oh, wow, I can't believe this exists. And also I have built three or four of these in my past life in different companies and all of that. Um, but of course, me, myself, right? Um, I was one of the first engineers at a startup called Affinity. Uh, it was a CRM that you know, investment professionals use uh, many VCs, many investment firms uh, use Affinity. Uh, and for us, um, I was one of the first engineers there, led the core product engineering team, met the founders at Stanford studying computer science. Uh, and then, of course, uh, as we were working on the product, one of the first things we had to build was the onboarding tool. And as you might imagine, our goal was to disrupt Salesforce, right? Uh, and, you know, make it possible for uh, all of the customers that we had to, you know, hopefully have a much more seamless integrations and experience around actually managing their deals, their deals lists and all of that inside of uh, you know, their system and inside of Affinity, uh, a better platform. Uh, but of course, getting anyone onto our platform required them to export their opportunities, accounts, contacts uh, from the system. And you would think, I mean, we thought as an engineering team that there would be some sort of an API integration that was possible with Salesforce. Uh, turns out that's not the case. Um, there are too many custom fields, too many custom columns inside of that system. And so we had to build a CSV in order, right, uh, to actually enable our customers to upload spreadsheets in order to even onboard onto the platform. Um, now, uh, we also, you know, being, you know, new grads, Stanford engineers, we were like kind of, you know, very, uh, had a lot of hubris. We had a lot of confidence. We were like, okay, we can build this in two weeks. We'll just take an open source CSV parser, put it in front of a Postgres database. No issues. We'll be done in two weeks. Uh, and it took, you know, four different versions and four different years of us building this to handle all of the edge cases, right? Things like, you know, uh, is October 10th, 2023, uh, does that translate to 10 slash 10 23 or 10 slash 10 2023, 10 10? Is it in Europe? If it's in Europe, it's flipped, right? Uh, stuff like that just caused like years of engineering time when it comes to iterating on the unstructured data that comes in. Um, and as you might imagine, um, our customers were not happy when we got it wrong. Uh, and so we ended up hiring a team of five Excel analysts to manually clean every single file first uh, before uh, you know, one of our customers was able to onboard onto our platform. Um, now we charge professional services for this. It was like, you know, fine for the business, but any engineer looking at, you know, a team of people cleaning spreadsheets nine to five every day, you know, you just have that spark where you're just like, there's no way this is the best way to do this. And so that was kind of the inspiration for starting this company. That, I mean, I was smiling, but also crying from the inside because I've been there <laughs> and it's crazy to me that, you know, nobody has built a product like this before because We've all been there trying to tweak that spreadsheet, the CSV file, click the import button, then there's an error, you spend way too much time, and it's not really adding a ton of value for the user. Exactly, exactly. But everyone needs to onboard their customers and onboard their customers' data, most importantly, right, when it comes to this sort of flow. Um, and you just think about the hours and hours. I mean, this is what pained me when it came to starting this company. Just like you think about the hours and hours of time that, you know, we as a human species are spending cleaning spreadsheets and you just, you know, deeply feel like there must be a better way. So I can imagine that now with Gen AI, this has been able to, you know, this has been turbocharged, right? Yeah, 100%. So I think that there are a few ways we think about, obviously, you know, since, you know, a couple of years ago, ChatGPT took the world by storm. Uh, and then, of course, um, as you think about this space of spreadsheets, you just open up every AI research paper and it starts with a benchmark, right, of how does this LLM perform on this type of CSV. And so, of course, um, researchers have been trying to use LLMs on spreadsheets long before even uh, ChatGPT uh, you know, came out. Like AI and spreadsheets have been kind of the like, you know, peanut butter and jelly of the data world. Um, but of course, um, the reason it's so interesting is because, uh, you know, why can't you just put a spreadsheet directly into ChatGPT uh, and then just use it, right? Why is one schema need to exist as a company? 
Uh, it turns out, uh, actually, because of you know the way spreadsheets are, we sometimes handle spreadsheets with like tens or twenty, you know, thirty million rows of, of data all at once, and that's quite difficult to load the entirety of that spreadsheet into an AI system. And so what we find for our product is the best way to use AI is to actually use it for code generation. Uh, so two aspects of our product strategy involve AI. Firstly, it's, of course, um, being able to create transformations on top of the spreadsheet. So things like the date uh, transformation that I just mentioned, uh, addresses are quite unstructured. Those are quite difficult. Um, and so all of those little pieces I would say AI can, is quite good actually at creating transformations that can be run on the spreadsheet. And then of course, they use the atoms underneath the hood inside of one schema, like row merging and column splitting that we built uh, to make it performant. And so performance is obviously a huge issue. The second thing is actually recommendations. Um, one schema is a guided ETL experience. So you upload any unstructured spreadsheet into one schema and we guide the user through the process of transforming the data. It turns out AI is actually also quite good at recommending uh, which transformation to use uh, because in you know a library of transforms inside of one schema, we can have like thousands of transforms for accounting data, for HR data, for ERP data, right? All of these sorts of things. And so being able to find the right transform rather than having the user browse through a giant catalog of these, uh, that's another great use case for AI for us. Uh, but inherently, right, the industry being, you know, very AI driven uh, is also just a great tailwind for one schema in general. Uh, you know, AI is inherently like insatiable for data and your customer's data is actually probably the most valuable data set for any company or any enterprise. And so being able to ingest as much of it into your system as possible, especially if it's unstructured like spreadsheets, uh, makes one schema really valuable for like a whole broader swath of use cases, which is really exciting. And for me, something that I still trying to wrap my head around is, okay, again, AI is helping make data transfer of CSVs faster and better, fine. But like CSV as a format has been around since forever, right? And now there are other formats, APIs, web groups, you name it. So why are we all still doing the CSV thing and there are no other formats that can potentially replace it? That is a great question. And that is a question that I think we all had too when we were first building a CSV importer. Like, Surely APIs are going to, you know, replace the CSV soon, right? Like, you know, is it in the next year, next two years? When is that going to happen? And then, of course, right, like, you know, we have Snowflake and, you know, DBT and Fivetran and all these other solutions. Why are CSVs still being sent around? Um, and, you know, from talking to also a lot of folks in the space, right, it's clear that, like, you know, 10 years ago, people thought that APIs were going to connect the world, right, when it comes to all of the business data. But, you know, we're in July 2024, the age of AI, and like, you know, we're still emailing spreadsheets to each other. Uh, and so something feels a little bit like, you know, unintuitive about that. Um, I think the contrarian viewpoint that is at the core of one schema is that CSVs are going to be here to stay. Uh, you know, anecdotally, Excel is the number one ETL tool in the world still, right, uh, when it comes to how people move business data around. Uh, and I think the key insight uh, behind our company is that when it comes to internal data transfer, right? You know, the average SaaS company or every average enterprise company today has like 300 SaaS tools or something insane like that. And the way people connect those tools internally does tend to be using like, you know, data warehouses, APIs, these sorts of things. But the trick is cross company data exchange is really difficult because the two parties holding the source and the destination schemas don't actually agree. Right, you can send data from one Salesforce to another, and they are completely different schemas. And the trick is that there are non-technical people owning that cross-company relationship. It's always support people, CSMs, professional services, AEs, right? And the truth is, they don't read JSON, and I mean, none of us really read JSON, even engineers. Uh, but like, you know, especially for you know, you know, customer-facing roles, right? Uh, and that's why spreadsheets are so persistent. That's why it's way easier to just send a spreadsheet to your customer uh, and then make it that make that workflow. And so, actually, um, one of our advisors um, was the chief data officer of a Fortune 500 company, uh, where you know half of the employees in the United States are employed on their platform. And actually, 90% of the data going in and out of that company still happens through files, um, whether it's banks sending files, whether it's you know uh, HR systems sending files. 
it still files despite you know having a massive API marketplace. Uh, you know something like you know hundreds of millions of files still get sent into that. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's also like it's less, it's easier, right? It's less technical. Everybody's familiar with the attaching a file to an email or. or similar, but then not everybody is familiar with connecting to APIs, even if it's in a visual form that doesn't really require a lot of uh, technical expertise. Exactly. And that makes it expensive, right, to build integrations. Um, if you have to build an API connection, you need engineers to do that. And yeah, uh, I mean, no product manager wants to use their engineering resources building one-off <laughs> integrations to every customer, right? <laughs> But let, let's talk about some of the, the, the craziest or the, the biggest uh, examples that you have of like companies, how they're leveraging these type of integrations for, you know, to drive business outcomes. Yeah, great question. So we work with one of the large credit bureaus, actually. Um, and, you know, I mean, a lot of folks think about one schema and they think of, you know, Silicon Valley tech companies, right? Uh, you know, what they use, you know, CSV imports for. And, you know, that is a very common use case. But especially what we found is that actually outside of tech, right, is where the biggest pains in CSVs actually exist. Uh, and so, yeah, one of these examples, one of our customers, one of the large credit bureaus, uh, actually, uh, for the purposes of actually calculating their credit scores, right, how do you do that? You actually need to ingest uh, the accounting and accounts receivable data from all of the different, you know, folks in type, inside of a credit organization or a, or a credit um, uh group, right, uh, in order for them to actually determine uh, whether someone is a good customer to partner with, whether someone is a good lender, uh, actually all of them together send all of their financial data into a credit bureau so that they can actually manage the credit scores for everyone in that credit group. That is one of the craziest use cases that we've seen because the accounting systems, right, whether it's QuickBooks, Sage, SAP, none of them agree, even on like how the money is actually laid out. Is it like one to 30 days overdue, one to seven days overdue, one to 14 days overdue, and how it's even sliced out in terms of time buckets um, needs to be normalized into a standard format so that you can actually process a credit score. Uh, that's the, the output is basically just, does this company have good credit? Does this company not? Um, and in order to process that, you actually have to ingest on a you know, daily or hourly basis, right? Like all of these files, and it turns out they have to be files um, from like, you know, the thousand companies that are within this trade group. Yeah, and I love what you said about being a tech company in Silicon Valley sell selling outside the, the Silicon Valley tech bubble. I resonate with that. That's part of what we do as well. And when we go out there and start training or, or offering our services to large companies, they, they speak a different language. And I think it's important for us as vendors to also speak that language. Um, I can imagine when you go and interact with these type of Fortune 500 companies, they already use something. Maybe they built their own legacy solution like you did before you started your own one schema, or they use a, another vendor you know, that's been around for longer. So how do you go about you know, having that, earning that, that opportunity? Great question. Great question. Um, I'll start with, you know, we obviously, you know, first talk to the customer, try to understand what they're doing, right? And especially with these large enterprises, I think it's a, it's a trap to go in assuming that they, you know, know how like, you know, the modern data stack works or, you know, all of these sorts of things. Because you'll, you'll go in and ask them, right? Like, hey, like, you know, do you use DBT? And they'll be like, you know, what is DBT? Right, like that's 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 you know very common, and so actually it's really just a, a, a you know a, a consultative kind of, of sale, right? When it comes to these sorts of companies, um, we've seen everything from I still have a team of fifty people using Excel macros and VBA scripts uh, doing this process. Uh, sometimes people do use some of the legacy ETL providers, things like you know Informatica, you know Boomi, these sorts of you know older, you know not even quite cloud native ETL tools. Um, but actually, uh, the majority of people are actually writing you know scripts, right? Uh, C sharp scripts, Python scripts. They have a Git repo of like five hundred of them. Uh, maybe an intern built one and they copied it like you know a hundred times, and that's why. Uh, that's how their integration stack works. Um, and so that's really what we typically see, uh, especially when it comes to files and file integrations. And that's kind of the, the opportunity uh, that, you know, we see when we work with these large companies where you're like, okay, you're, you're spending, you know, lots and lots of engineering team time on this and 
you're also worried that your company is not going to scale uh, because you have to you know, linearly scale your engineering team with the size of your customer base. And I can imagine your type of product is, is very sticky, but it also requires some time up front to integrate the system the right way. Right. So I'm very interested in that go to market motion and maybe how it's evolved over time. So you go out there, you have that initial conversation, but then what? Yeah, great question. So actually, um, we started off really being quite a developer focused uh, you know, tool. And we we still are very much like you know, we like to see an engineer on the call, right? We love to see the CTO, right? Like that's great because then we knew that it's not going to be a, a tough integration process, right? Uh, because we have, you know, React, JavaScript, SDKs, right? Things like that to make it really easy to embed. Um, but when we first started out, like we only had like, I remember we were giving people like an iframe, like a, like it's just a straight up iframe that they could use to put into their web app. Um, and um, if we, if we had the customer's engineering team or engineering uh, buy-in uh, from the get-go, uh, it was going to be a much easier conversation. As we've actually matured as a company, uh, increasingly, we don't actually necessarily need to see engineers in the calls at all. Uh, actually, we've seen lots of cases now where a product manager or even a business stakeholder or professional services or customer success actually is able to get one schema integrated without actually necessarily needing to be um, and this is kind of a, an interesting insight, which is that I think actually the best developer experience is one where the developer doesn't have to be involved at all. Um, that's maybe a little bit counterintuitive rather than, you know, building all of these APIs and things like that. Um, we've really leaned into this idea of out of the box, no code validations and transforms because it turns out engineers don't really want to be managing this at all. And if you can tell them that one schema will just handle it, uh, they would much prefer that. Uh, all of your, no more regexes, no more Python scripts, none of that. You just embed one schema with a code snippet, right? 30 minutes, drop it in, uh, and then you're good to go. Uh, that is actually the most magical experience is what we found. Um, and so actually our go-to-market motion has accelerated. Our, our sales cycles have gotten shorter as a result of actually trying to build out more and more of the modules inside of one schema, no code, so that the PM can do it. Like the designer can brand it now without needing engineers to like, you know, write CSS. Uh, the more that we've done that, actually, the smoother and faster uh, our go-to-market motion has been. That's in line with what I've seen in the market. A lot of the products that are now being bought directly by product team members do not require that much of an input from engineering. Obviously, it's good when they are involved, but it, it's not like before where like the CTO was the gatekeeper for all things tech, right? And everybody was there knocking at their door begging to, to have the option to integrate whatever. Now they think that power has been democratized much more and especially business people, product people are able to even play with those tools and have their own use cases where they can hopefully get some value and then use it as a, a stepping stone to, to do a wider integration. Exactly. Because if you're a product manager, right, you don't really want your Q3 roadmap to have CSV import as the thing that's going to be one of the big line items on your Q3 roadmap. I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole thing we're trying to avoid, right? Is that you don't have like two engineers for eight sprints on, on CSV import, right? Uh, and so of course, if you go into these conversations and are like, oh, actually I need like, I still need your engineers to do this, that, and the other thing. It just, it just makes the whole thing a little bit tougher, right? When it comes to actually, what is the value of a, of a tool like one schema? Yeah. So how do you measure that value? Right? What are some of the specific, uh... KPIs that your clients use as a way to show that this experiment or this integration is successful? Great question. So obviously engineering team time is, is, is huge, right? Uh, build versus buy, uh, we think a lot about that trade-off. And so in service of that, our product strategy has been very much around, we want to make sure that you as a product manager, when you partner with one schema, within 30 minutes, you can go live with one schema. Right. Your CSV importer is live, your schemas, your validations, your transforms, all of that can all be set up within the time span of 30 minutes. And we do this with you on a call uh, and show you how easy it is to actually go in and embed that. That is, I think, the number one thing, right? Because it's not just engineering team time when it comes to the cost, but also oftentimes people are launching new products when they are trying to use a CSV importer. It's the onboarding experience. You can't actually launch without it. And so people also think about it as how quickly can I launch my new product and go to market? Right, uh, I have a new differentiator. I have a new, you know, product feature that needs a CSV importer. Can I actually launch in, you know, one month instead of three because I've partnered with one schema? That actually matters a lot to people. 
Uh, and then the second thing that actually some of our more mature customers in the enterprise, when they partner with one schema, they think about two things. They think about obviously engineering team time if it's the integrations use case. I have a team of you know 30 data engineers. Can I actually scale to being five times the size that I am with only, you know, without growing headcount in that team? That's actually really important to a lot of executives. Uh, and then on the onboarding side, conversion rates and drop off rates end up being the number one thing. Uh, a lot of people build their own in-house CSV importers. They don't really have errors. <laughs> you upload a CSV and then they basically email you saying like, hey, it didn't work. Like row one failed, please try again. Uh, and so uh, we end up seeing that there are people uploading CSVs like eight, nine times, trying to get it into a system um, and then dropping off and then creating a support ticket uh, saying, hey, I, I got stuck. And so that, and that process ends up being the other big KPI. Like what is my drop off rate? Um, and what percentage of my customers can get uploaded and then onboarded in, the, in one shot? Uh, and we strive for something like a, you know, 70% of customers uploading a file can get it in cleanly in one shot without needing to actually like, you know, fix the file again and upload it. So that's like the, the other KPI that matters a lot. Yeah, and I, I think that is key because I've been there before, right? Where, I don't know, customer support would say, oh my God, we're spending a lot of time <laughs> importing these tickets. Or someone in marketing would say, we have this list of leads and we need to put them on Salesforce. And I'm trying to assess, okay, what's the actual business impact? Like, do I really need to bring a sales ops person or an engineer to really automate this? Or can they survive and can the engineers spend time somewhere else? So I think translating those pain points into business and showing a business outcome that a business person is going to understand to actually prioritize instead of seeing a line on their roadmap that says maintenance or as you said, like CSV integration. Right. And the truth is the customer success team is probably bugging the engineering team already today, right? Totally. Uh, the problem is the engineering team is probably not prioritizing it either. And so <laughs> I think a lot of cases, the engineering team finally decided to go and prioritize it after maybe like what we saw was like, you know, quarters and quarters of customer success and support being like, hey, like this is really painful, please, can you prioritize this? And then it eventually gets onto the roadmap. At which point, hopefully, right, someone is like, oh, there's a better solution for this. We should just solve this once by partnering with one schema. So I feel like the definition of the idea data stack has evolved constantly, right? Like the, the start of the CDPs, customer data platforms, now different types of ETS, APIs, and all the things in between, like the data warehouses, the cloud, now Gen AI. So could you paint a picture for what the ideal data stack should look like? Yeah, great question. So obviously I think, you know, the modern data stack is is great. And obviously Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift, all of these data warehouses, I think serve as the HQ, right? For all of your internal data. Uh, the tricky thing is that I think people, when it comes to the using this modern data stack are almost like using it also for data transfer external to them. And that's where I think people run into trouble. Because when it comes to the data warehouse, the way it works is that all of your internal systems, you use you know, an ELT provider, Fivetran, Airby, what have you, you mirror the data into your warehouse, and then you use you know, what I call like the layers of the onion of DBT, right? Uh, to basically transform each and every bit of it into your gold standard of clean data and what that means to you in the warehouse. Where it gets really dangerous is when you actually then start using that for your customer data. Because if you think about it, each of your customers also has 300 SaaS tools as well that all look different than your 300 SaaS tools. And what we've seen is that it gets really messy inside of the data warehouse if you try to use Fivetran with your customer's data instead of actually using Fivetran as it was designed, right, for all of the different, um, you know, internal systems that you're dealing with. And also these... Customers are sending you this data through like on-prem systems, CSVs, you know, uh, EDI, right? Like all of these different types of formats that also aren't really designed for the modern data stack. And so actually the ideal approach is you use one schema as like a shell for your company. Uh, this is like the data governance layer that protects your company from the outside world. Uh, and the way we see it is like large enterprises, like maybe like a, you know, like a Kraft Heinz, right? Uh, the vision for one schema is to be the de facto platform for all cross-company data exchange. Uh, one schema can wrap every upload button inside of your application. It can wrap 
every SFTP server that you use to receive data, every API endpoint that receives files, every you know uh, email server <laughs> that is actually receiving spreadsheets. And actually, by doing that, um, one schema normalizes all of your customers' messiness into a known schema <laughs> that you actually internally know uh, as these are my contacts, these are my transactions, uh, these are my employee data. Uh, and then at that point, you can use your you know, standard modern data stack uh, to then ingest it into your warehouse without messing up the data quality for everyone else. And so that's, I think, the vision. So it's the idea that once you are that umbrella that gets all the data from whatever sources, then once, how do you go into the application layer for a, for a user, for, a, for an employee, so they can also start using the data however they want to? Great question. So when it comes to destination connections, we do a few different things. The most popular one is, you know, we drop it into directly into, you know, a data lake, right? Like S3, Azure, GCS, right? Like these sorts of places. Um, we also most commonly use webhooks to actually uh, give the engineering team clean JSON, right? Uh, the hard thing is, of course, not getting the JSON into the database. The hard thing is getting the JSON to be one shape <laughs> instead of, you know, n different customer shapes. Uh, and so one schema has this idea of a template inside of the system where anybody can configure a clean JSON schema inside of one schema that we can guarantee that all customer data going into it comes out in that shape. You can configure it, add whatever columns you like. Uh, and then at that point, it's really easy to connect that into your SQL database, your warehouse, wherever it needs to go. Andrew, I, this was one of my favorite episodes because I love geeking out on spreadsheets and, and CSVs. Thank you so much for, for bearing with me. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Carlos. <laughs>